this is the second Sunday of Easter, the day where the Gospel reading traditionally focuses on the disciple Thomas, the one we call Doubting Thomas. Listen now to the Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter, beginning with verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. We most likely know the story. Back in verse 19 of chapter 20, Jesus appears in the midst of his disciples despite the fact that they are hunkered down in a locked room, a room that the authors of John's Gospel remind us is locked because they are afraid, perhaps afraid that they too may soon suffer the same fate that befell Jesus. Now Jesus enters their midst and says to them, Peace be with you. And he then shows them his hands and his side. I wonder about this little detail. Would they perhaps not have known him if he didn't show them the wounds? It seems rather strange. Perhaps there is something else to this. It's just a side point this morning, but just to examine it for a moment, my guess is but they would have known their Lord and Teacher, even if he had been resurrected with wounds completely healed. And indeed, if Jesus could overcome death, then surely he would have repaired the damage done by the nails and the spear if he wanted to. But that may not be the point. It is possible that Jesus kept the wounds, so to speak, because they were now a part of him evidence of his forgiving love, and moreover, evidence of the way the Father does things, taking the very worst of what humanity can dish out, and not annihilating it, but transforming it into something better. What man intends for evil, God may transform, redeem, as it were, for good. Perhaps then, when we ourselves come into the fullness of the resurrection, we will find ourselves not without some of the things the world may see as shortcomings, but rather those supposed shortcomings will be transformed into something blessed and wonderful, an evidence of God's love and our own uniqueness in his sight. Whatever the reason. Jesus shows the disciples his wounds when he enters their midst. Most likely, when they told Thomas their wonderful news, they explained it to him just how it happened. We were all sitting around talking, well, complaining, really. Then all of a sudden, Jesus was standing there plain as day. We all see him. He said, Peace be with you. Then... He shows us the place where the nails had pierced him and the spear. If the disciples had said something like that to Thomas, it is no wonder that he went on to say, Well, I'll believe that when I get to see those wounds, not just see, but touch. The following week, eight days later, as our text reads, Thomas' request, as it were, is... Granted, Jesus appears again, and Jesus directly addresses Thomas. Go ahead, Tommy. I'm real. You can touch me. You can touch the places where I was wounded. Yes, Thomas, 
wounded for you, wounded for everyone. Now, Thomas makes a confession of faith of my Lord and my God. And Jesus says most famously, Thomas, you have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen. If we stop right now, we will, with a little bit of thought, recognize that Thomas, the supposed doubter, is actually in the same place as the other disciples. After all, a week earlier, they all got to see. Thomas simply wanted the same. And who could blame him? They had all seen Jesus dragged off to a, a, a mockery of court, all seen or at least heard about the poor excuse for a trial, and of course about his gruesome execution. They were undoubtedly struggling with feelings of guilt and anger, with suspicion and most likely fear. They had been through way too much to take anything on hearsay. We single out Thomas for wanting visual, tactual proof. But the truth is, more than likely, they all needed that proof. By John's account, Mary needed to see Jesus, and the other disciples needed to have Jesus enter their midst. Thomas was really no different. So when Jesus said, Blessed are those who believe and have not seen, he was clearly not talking about those in the room. He was talking about those who would come later, those who would not have the opportunity to look at Jesus standing right there in their midst, plain as day. To have such faith, to believe in what is not seen, not only not seen, but also so very unlikely, a man beaten and killed and come back from the dead, that sort of faith is a gift, a profound blessing. How many have such a blessing in our world today? It seems at first glance that blessing was once common enough. The existence of Christianity and even Christendom on some level may bear out the fact that many, many people must have believed in what they had not seen. Even if we take seriously the testimony of saints, martyrs, and self-proclaimed prophets throughout the ages, the greatest plurality of people who have confessed Jesus have made no claim to actually seeing him. But then again, how difficult was that really? In an age when to believe what we were told by religious authorities was the cultural expectation and the societal norm, and in fact to doubt what we were told, approached criminality. At the risk of sounding very negative, I would go so far as to question even the nature of the nominal belief that has been transmitted. And to back up my questioning, I offer as evidence the decidedly violent and bloody history of Christendom. Ironically, a history which did not deal well, did not at all deal in the gentle way that Jesus dealt with Thomas, with its own doubters. But I'll leave history, both ancient and not so ancient for a moment, to look at our present situation. Praise be to God, I would say. We live in a time when it is, at least to an extent, all right to question. It is perhaps even in some circles encouraged. In our day and age, it might be all right to be a doubter. Oh, Thomas, you evil doubter. You and your descendants shall be cursed even under the fourth generation for your lack of faith. And no, that is not at all what Jesus said. Jesus said nothing of the sort. In fact, Jesus was 
incredibly, amazingly gentle with Thomas. Why would that be? It is, I believe, because God is not afraid of doubters. Why would God be afraid of doubters? The God who created the heavens and the earth is not going to shrivel up and die because somehow we don't get it, or, or even because we want proof. Perhaps by our very inquisitive nature, God encourages us to examine our lives, our world, and even God's self. Perhaps the saying attributed to Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living, may be similarly applied to religion. The unexamined faith is not worth believing. I will here confess that I, in many ways, relate to Thomas. Had I not become a musician and then a preacher, I probably would have been a scientist. I love mathematics. I love solving mysteries. I annoyed my Sunday school teachers to no end with questions about why the biblical accounts of creation didn't line up with current scientific thought. And I was absolutely never happy with taking on faith as a legitimate answer to anything. I'm pretty sure that if I had been blessed to be one of the twelve, and it had been me who was out running errands when Jesus appeared, I would have wanted to see him before I believed my overwrought friend's testimonies. You got to see him. If it's really true, then I want to see him as well, is what I'm sure I would have said. The good news for me is that my ministry is mostly to people who are just like Thomas. People who wonder why they should believe the gospel as opposed to any of the other world's myriad creeds. People who are confused by contradictory religious philosophies. People who wonder about the meaning of life. People who wonder if there's a God at all. People who are angry at the state of the world. It's not hard to find such people to minister to. For nowadays, they are everywhere. Now, I'm not sure if you will consider this good news, but you are, all of you, as they used to say, within the sound of my voice. Well, your ministry, too, is more than likely focused on those who are just like Thomas. For let's face it, that is what we are like in the 21st century. A world full of Thomases. So what then shall we do? The answer is deceptively simple. Show them Jesus. And yes, show them the wounds. What could I possibly mean by this? The answer, if we take our call as members of the body of Christ seriously, we, you and I, are the only Jesus most people will ever get to see. Oh yes, there are those so blessed as to need no proof. They will simply believe. But the rest of us, we need to see. We need to touch. We need to experience something in order to believe. And so those who desire to follow Jesus, Christians, little Christs as it were, we must show the people Jesus by exemplifying a new way to live, a new order that I mentioned in last week's sermon. The wounds as well must be visible for all to see and even touch. The vulnerable nature of God. Those places where we have been hurt and yet have said, Father, forgive them. They just don't understand. Are our most powerful proof that there is something real to the Christian life. The world would scoff at Jesus and say he is either not real at all 
or just one more dead prophet. But by exemplifying Christ, by walking in the ways in which he walked, the ways of peace, non-retaliation, forgiveness, gentleness, and love, even when the world would wound us, we overcome the deathly nature of our culture. We are already connected on that level to our resurrected selves. We show the world by what we say, by what we do, also by what we do not say, and by what we do not do, that he is alive. He has risen indeed. Mm -hmm.